So last week, while I was on vacation with my mother and my brother, we went to an aquarium, which is like a totally normal thing for a mom and her children to do, right? Never mind the fact that she's in her 60s and we're in our 30s. And while we were at the aquarium, there was this ocean depth interaction screen, you know, that showed how deep the ocean is. And there was a meter that like started to go down and down and down. And, you know, it showed where the fish are. And then a little deeper, you know, they got to Crustacea and then where the Titanic sits, where the deepest humans have been, where the deepest fish are, where the light stops touching. And then it just keeps going and going and going and going. And it's like so deep that I can't even understand how we know that it exists if we can't actually really like go there or measure it. This deep, vast expanse of like miles and miles and miles down that the ocean goes. This is a little bit of what Paul is talking about in his prayer today in our second reading. He says, I hope that you comprehend the love of Christ that is so wide and so deep that you literally can't comprehend it. Like humans have only explored to a certain depth, but that this love of Christ just keeps going and going and going and going far beyond what we can see or understand. So how can we begin to comprehend the incomprehensible. This second reading we have here, uh, this is a prayer that we get at the end of the third chapter of this letter to the Ephesians. But in here, we have a key phrase that really sets the theme for the whole letter. That Christ's vast, incomprehensible love fills us over and over, and just like the loaves, there seems to be more and more and more and more and more. And so much that we have enough to share with others. See, this thing about the book of Ephesians um, is at the very beginning, in the very first chapter, in the very first verse, it says, from Paul to the saints who are in Ephesus. And the thing about this is, this little chunk here to the saints that are in Ephesus, this is not original. It was not in the original manuscripts. This was added later. Um, and in fact, in the Jerusalem Bible, they still don't have it in there because it's not original to the text. So this line to the saints who are in Ephesus, someone put that in later. Many scholars believe that's because this is a form letter that Paul dictated it to his assistants so that they could take it to any church that you know, needed a good pep talk and write their name in it and, and give it to them, right? And <laughs> can you just see it? I can see like Timothy or Barnabas or Silas being at one of these churches and having these arguments with the church leaders or they don't understand what's going on. And they're like, hang on, and just, you know, pull out of their pocket to the church in South Baltimore. Look, Paul wrote a letter just for you to explain what's going on here. So this was a form letter. But the thing about this letter that's kind of cool is the way that this letter is, it helps us to see ourselves inside of the text, inside of the letter. And I know I've said this before, and I want you to know, I did check the Greek of every single one of these that's in the text for today. All the yous here are plural. It is a you all or a y'all, depending on where you're from. It's not talking to one person. This letter is written to a community. And it probably would sound something like this. Insert your church name here. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of God's glory, God may grant that Salem may be strengthened in Salem's inner being with the power through God's spirit. 
and that Christ may dwell in Salem's heart through faith as Salem is being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that Salem may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Now to God, who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we could ever ask or imagine. To God be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Maybe something like this seems cold or distant or impersonal that it's like, you know, kind of like Mad Libs, you know, insert here what you want. Or it is exactly personal. For us to understand that no matter where we are or who we are, what community we're in, we too are prayed for by Paul. We too are included in the riches of God's glory. We too are strengthened to our inner being with the power of God's spirit, and that we too have Christ dwelling in our hearts through faith, grounded and rooted in love. This incomprehensible love of Christ that is so deep and so wide that we can't even begin to grasp that at all. This is something powerful. To think that about 2000 years ago, Paul was talking to us that we in this community and in every church community are a part of this body in Christ, that we are the y'all, that we are one of those churches that Paul's messengers went to to share this good news, to include us in the powers and promises of God. That's incredible. For the next few weeks, we are going to journey through this letter of Ephesians and see ourselves in these promises and love of Christ that Paul was so eager to share with not just the church in Ephesus, but in every church, inserting ourselves into this form letter and exploring what this form letter says directly to us as Salem in South Baltimore, and how we ourselves can be seen in this story, and how we can journey together farther into this unknowable, incomprehensible, vast expanse of Christ's love. Amen. <laughs>